Hey everyone, this is Keith Schleicher from Gaming Trend and Tabletop Throwdown, and I'm here with Keith Bloom of L4 Studios, and we're here to talk about uh, WarQuest, which has been um, around for a little while. At, <laughs> Long time coming, anyway. <laughs> yeah, it, it had a very successful Kickstarter last year, um, but it's taken a little while to get the production of the um, entire game down, but we are looking at that. We're very close to getting a final version of the game, right? Yeah, it's uh, in production at the factory right now. So we're in mid-June, and we're expecting the container to leave early July. So cool. we are we are now in production, and this is uh, really close to an advanced copy. We'll okay. So, so uh, tell me, Keith, a, a little bit about what WarQuest is about. So the, the backstory to WarQuest, um, you take the role of a warlord, and your goal is to reunify the land. The story behind it is the kingdoms of man have been at war for hundreds of years and have decimated each other, and in the process, push the different races of the land out to the periphery. And as you look at the board, you see those different races. Um, I have them in their different homelands. Your goal as a warlord is to reunify the land, and the way you win the game is by acquiring the most victory points. The way you get victory points is by going on quests, successfully conquesting, and going into combat. The vehicle for this is through cards in the game. So you have at the start of the game different conquest cards and quest cards. The conquest cards give you conditions that often involve, um, if you look at these, you're looking to reunify the Azure Kingdom and that's one of the kingdoms on the map. So if you control all those regions, you've accomplished that quite conquest and get victory points for that. Also in this group, you have an end game, a hidden end game condition, which will be to protect one of the cities. So you'll see over the course of the game, toward the end of the game, where people will be want to be migrating toward a particular location to protect. Quests involve going to a location on the board. There are different illustrations on the board other than cities or villages. And with quests, what you're doing is going to this location and overcoming an obstacle, defeating a monster. And that also, that success also gets you victory points. Those cards also are always, once you achieve one of those goals or fail in the case of a quest, you're drawing new cards, so your your mission is evolving or changing over the course of the game. The third way that you get victory points is by combat, and we have a um, combat board set up here. This is a case where you see the starting basic army for uh, players, which represent a unit from each race and each type of unit. You have melee units and ranged units. Each race has its own ability level, ability um, a trait in combat. And the other thing is this is a mercenary environment. So you notice that each race is represented in these armies. So you're not taking the role of like a goblin king or something. You can go around and recruit from each race. So before we get into combat, just an overview of what you can do on your turn. Each player has one of seven actions they can take, and you get three actions per turn. The actions are pretty straightforward in that you can move, you can take control of a region. For people who are familiar, um, the design team behind WarQuest is the same team that did Age of Empires 3. So this is Glenn Drover from Eagle Games, and Sean Brown and I did the development work and we're the publishers on the game. Um, so those of you familiar with Glenn's game, this idea of controlling a region is like Conquest of the Empire and Struggle of Empire. So that, that, that's the mechanic that he pulled in from that. So that's another action you can take. You can tax. So if you control a city that has a number below it, 
you control this region, you can tax. If you're in a location that has one of the races, one of their homelands, you can recruit. If you're in a location that we were talking about before that has one of the a quest locations, you can take an action to go on a quest. You can recruit a lieutenant, which you have to be in a city to do that. Also, if you're in a city, you can purchase a power card from the market. Power cards are spells or pieces of equipment that help you in battle or on quests. And that's, I think, pretty much all the actions you have, right? Yeah. Yep. So, and you said three of them, you get three actions per turn. Can yeah. you do the same um, action? That's more a great. Than once? That's a great question. So, um, in some cases, yes. In some, no. So the, the board itself has geography to it. And so to answer your question, the same army cannot be moved more than three. So if I take a move action, the maximum I can move an army is three spaces. So I can't take an army and basically move it across the entire map. Mm -hmm. I also can't cross mountains. And if you cross rivers, there are rules for that as well. So. That's a limit, and also you cannot tax the same city in the same turn. So I can't just tax this. I can't tax, tax, and tax from the three actions. I can tax different cities, but not the same city. And you were talking before um, about different races, but all the races are in these different factions, right? The races are, they have their own locations, I can recruit whatever race I want to. So it's a mercenary environment. So my army, these armies actually consist of every race in the game. For beginners, we have a recommended starting army, and this is in fact the starting army, and that represents one of each unit type in the, each unit type and each race type. The, the races have a melee unit and a ranged unit. And that plays a role in how combat unfolds. So, um, did the melee units? Why don't we just go into combat here now? It is a game called War Quest, so that <laughs> right. seems appropriate, right? Um, so we have the different flanks that we can see. You have the um, the front rank, the rear rank, and then the reserves. Are melee units automatically going into the front rank and uh, archer type, like long range units, automatically going into the rear? Yeah, that's exactly right. And it's also a situation that drives the strategy of how you assemble your army in the game. Because the, the way combat unfolds as an attacker, if you enter a space with another player, you automatically go into combat. And you have to go through rounds. So you, you're you not in a situation where you can negotiate and say, look, I'm just gonna pass through your land and we're not gonna fight. You have to engage in a full round, barring a spell. There's a spell called Fog that allows you to basically isolate a uh, army and keep it from going into battle. But co-locating means you're going to fight. So this isn't a negotiation game, right? This is a mercenary environment, and you're trying to take over. So what happens is, is as you move in, the defender gets to roll first, but combat is resolved simultaneously. The phases are this. The ranged ranks resolve first. When a ranged rank fires, that player can determine which rank they wish to attack, but they have to declare it first. An undeclared attack means you're attacking the other ranged location. Then what happens, so after that combat is resolved, and we'll show that in a second, then you can fill in from reserves, then the melee resolves, then you can fill in from reserves, and if you have any troops that flee, they can rally. Then the attacking player decides whether to retreat, and then the defending player decides whether to retreat if that's something that's necessary. How it works, what you have, let me show you an example here. The bases have, is that shadow right? Uh, it's good. 
The bases have nubs on the front and in the back. The nubs on the front tell you their attack rating, which determines the number of dice they can roll. The nub in the back tells you their um, defense rating, how many hits they can take. The dice have a hit, which is a skull, and a flag, which is a retreat. The rest of them are blank, which don't do anything. So there's really no defense in here. Correct. The defense is just a, a, a passive trait of the unit. Okay. Or I should say that's for a, an expansion. <laughs> <laughs> so what would happen then is we is we're engaging in combat. The defender gets to roll first, but again, these are resolved simultaneously. So as we look at the uh, tabs or nubs on the front of these, what you see is, is your, the satyr archer has two. That's one of your better archers. Um, the orc archer, which isn't quite as good, has one. The elf archer has two. The goblin and the dwarf each have one. So the total of your uh, tabs in the back end is seven. Now, this is where one of the racial abilities presents itself in that the elf melee unit also gets to contribute uh, a role in the archer rank, so all elves are basic archers. It's kind of like all marines are basic mm -hmm. rifle. That's right. what I was in another life. So <laughs> I can relate to that. Um, so we would roll eight dice for this. What I've done is rolled three retreats. Now I didn't declare, so as a result, these are going to be applied to the, the back rank. A combat damage has to be issued first, and if this rank hits it, we'll see, which would introduce another one of the racial traits in that the dwarves have to be hit first. So they're your tanks. Mm -hmm. They also have a two defense, so they mm -hmm. really are your tanks. Mm -hmm. So that's something strategically, if you want to kind of defend some top tier mm -hmm. units, having dwarves in your ranks would be a big deal because you know they can soak up some hits to start with. So in this case, we don't have any hits. The retreats aren't necessary for the dwarves, but actually I would apply that as well. So in this case, I want to retreat the dwarf and the three good archers, but because combat resolves simultaneously, they still get to participate in this rank attack. Now this group is gonna declare actually shooting at this, the melee rank first. So they also have because these armies are exactly the same. So their role is the same in eight as well. They did one hit. As I mentioned, you have to apply that hit to the dwarves. So, this marker shows that that dwarf has been hit. So in this case, no units have been lost. These guys now retreat to the back rank. Now the front, then, then the front rank will go. That's right. And basically do the same thing. That's right. There's no case, for example, if this unit had been defeated, this would be an opportunity to refill. And if I wanted to bring one of my leaders, so these, we have bases. The this is your lieutenant. He has a two-two ability, but we have the bases to show ownership for these. That's also your, your control tokens as well. So if I wanted to, I could bring one of them into the ranks. Leaders also have a hierarchy in combat. They're the last to take damage and they're not impacted by retreats. Cool. So it's, um, it seems to be fairly quick combat. And then after each round um, of combat with the rear ranks and the front ranks, um, you can determine if you want to retreat or not. Yes, and one of the reasons why I targeted that front rank is there's also a case where you don't get to decide. If your front rank is ever empty and you're not able to put another unit in there, recognizing that ranged units cannot go in the front rank and mm -hmm. the melee rank can't go in ranged, um, if ever you cannot put a unit into the front rank, you have to retreat, right? Okay. The, the ranged units are not going to stick around to fight right. your infantry coming over the lines. Um, 
Yes, the, the combat's designed, we wanted to... Once you know the racial abilities, we, we try and keep those as, as straightforward as possible, but we wanted to have differences. We wanted you to have a reason to, to be recruiting different units. Um, you, uh, it rewards like actually having interracial armies, right? <laughs> There's some kind of bigger me meta message there. <laughs> um, but yes, we wanted the combat to, to be fast because we recognize that the downtime is something that, while we want to have a game with lots of interesting decisions, you don't want the other players to just kind of be watching. What I've found is, is as we're playing the games, I am interested in what's happening with these attacks because if two armies basically decimate each other, I may want to come in, finish off an army, because if you win battles, you get victory points for that. Mm -hmm. So if I can engage with a weaker army and grab victory points, right, that's just right. adding to, to my total. Um, we've also designed it, you, you saw the, the faces of the die. You can engage in battles and it doesn't have to be a blood zest, mm -hmm. right? You have cases where as you develop more powerful armies over the course of the game, they can be, and you can mm -hmm. you can basically fight it out. That's it's it's kind of can be a prisoner's dilemma, so to speak. <laughs> um, if both players are like, no, I want the victory points, or this is a strategic location, that can happen. But you can also have cases where you engage in a skirmish and, and whatnot, mm -hmm. and go back and forth. I think having the dice set up the way they do really captures the idea of combat nicely and that you can have a force engaged that is more powerful but if the if the roll of the dice mm -hmm. kind of go against you you can have a weaker force kind of come through combat's like that. Mm -hmm. so i think without getting overly complex there's a there's a nice right. layer of probability that's mm -hmm. been baked into the process yeah. so how long do the games typically take the game is driven by number of turns, so you could choose to do 12 or 16 turns. You could even change that, but those are right. what we have okay. in the world. The games tend to run about two and a half hours. Okay. So and that's, it plays for two to four players out of the box. Okay, so two to four, four players, and how much will this retail for? When it's 120. Out? And what okay. you see on this table is what's in the box. It's, uh, in fact, I could show you that doesn't show. So the footprint, is uh, 12 by 14. I'm pretty sure that's what that is. But it's also pretty deep. Yeah. So there's a lot of figures there. Um, over 100. Uh, yep. Over. Wow. And then uh, like there's some plastic coins there, and then um, some of the um, tokens, um, and then uh, several. Lots of cards. cards. Yeah. So a, a lot of game there. A lot of game. It's a dense package. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.